my message title is like seed sown on good soil like seed sown on good soil let me pray our Heavenly Father we come to you to listen to you please empty our hearts of all other things Help us to give our attention fully to listening to your word. And please speak to us the wonderful message of grace and love that you have for us. Please help me deliver this message by your Holy Spirit's guidance from beginning to end. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the key verse is verse 20. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. May we read this verse all together quietly, please? Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. As we heard last Sunday, Jesus made his disciples and those who followed him his family members. And it's such a beautiful truth that Jesus makes his people his family members. And now from uh, this teaching today, Jesus will focus on the kingdom of God as he instructs them. Jesus' purpose in coming into the world was to establish the kingdom of God. His first message was the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He preached this from the beginning to the end. But the kingdom of God is so mysterious. We cannot fully explain the kingdom of God in propositional statements. So Jesus also used parables to explain the kingdom of God. A parable is a placing beside a comparison of one thing to another. It reveals something hidden from something that we can see and understand. Jesus' parables have been called earthly stories with heavenly meanings. These parables are given for us to understand the kingdom of God. But in order to do so, we have to really listen carefully and give our hearts to try to understand the meaning. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field. This treasure cannot be discovered by human reason or human effort alone. We need the help of the Holy Spirit at this moment, I humbly ask the Holy Spirit to come illuminate our hearts. In today's passage, Jesus taught the parable of the sower. And this is basic to understanding his other parables. This parable was given with a simple agricultural setting, something people of the time were very familiar with since many of them were farmers. If Jesus told his parable in our time, he might refer to computers or smartphones. This parable teaches us how to bear fruit. Everyone wants to be fruitful. <laughs> Nobody wants to be unfruitful. But what does it really mean to be fruitful. Some people confuse fruitfulness and success. 
fruitfulness is different than success in this world. In the Bible, fruitfulness is primarily growing in the image of Christ, that we become more and more like Jesus, more loving, more joyful, more gracious, more compassionate, more merciful, holier, like Jesus. Suppose someone earns a lot of money and becomes famous and powerful and has many followers, but their personal life is ruled by the power of sin. They behave shamefully in private. Is that person fruitful? Of course not. Such a person is tormented by guilt and shame. They have no peace, no joy. A truly fruitful person is one who has Jesus in their heart and grows to be like Jesus. God wants us to bear this kind of fruit. So Galatians 5.22 tells us the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These kinds of fruit make us really happy. Today, let's learn how we can bear fruit as Jesus' disciples. First, the parable of the sower and its purpose, verses 1 through 12. Verse 1 starts with the words, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The scene has shifted from a house in last week's passage to a lake. At this time, Jesus was facing strong opposition from envious religious leaders. He was in a spiritual battle and he withdrew to the lake to focus on teaching the word of God instead of fighting with the religious leaders. Jesus' focus, Jesus' spirit, his passion was to preach the word of God. Jesus preached the word in season and out of season. Wherever he went, he preached the word in a house, on a mountainside, in the synagogue, walking along the road, and here by the lake. And where there was a great Bible teacher, so many people gathered. Jesus had to get in a boat and set out a little from shore while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Jesus' crisp, clear voice carried nicely along the water's surface, and everyone could hear him very well. Jesus' words gave life to the perishing, forgiveness to the guilty, hope to the despairing, healing to the brokenhearted. Jesus' words refresh our souls and give us true rest. Jesus taught the crowd many things by parables. Before telling a parable, he would say, listen, uh, exclamation point, listen. <laughs> and after he said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Jesus really emphasized listening. Why? On the surface, his parable of the sower would be too simple to consider. But it had a deep spiritual meaning. And to really understand it required listening carefully with full attention. Only those who are humble in heart with an alert spirit, can listen like this. If someone is proud and distracted by many other things, 
they cannot listen. After saying to listen, Jesus went on to tell a story, which I will paraphrase. A farmer went out to sow his seed in the early spring. Maybe it was mid-March. Springtime is coming. The seed fell on four different kinds of soil. Some fell along the path. The farmers walked on these paths in between their fields, and the seed just sat there on the surface. It couldn't get in to the ground. And there was a hungry, angry bird nearby. And the bird swooped down and gobbled the seed and ate it. Ah, nom, nom, nom. So tasty for the bird. But for the seed, the end of the story. Other seed fell on rocky places. We know that plants need light and heat from the sun in order to grow. And as usual, the sun came up and provided energy. Did you know the sun always provides energy for us? 20,000 times what is needed by all people every day. Wow, thank God for the sun. So the sun came up, but under the bright sunshine in that shallow soil, the seed grew quickly and without a root, it was scorched. It withered, it died. Other seed fell among thorns. It soaked in water and nutrients and it began to grow but the surrounding plants were growing more rapidly. And despite its valiant struggle, it was overcome by the other plants and choked and died. Still other seed fell on good soil. It sprouted leaves. It took root and it began to grow. It received sunshine and water and nutrition. Photosynthesis took place and it sprouted so much. Even though heavy rains came and the wind blew, it just took deeper and deeper root through all the hardship. And then in the course of time, it blossomed and it produced amazing fruit. Some 30 times some 60 times, some 100 times. It was amazing. And the farmer was so happy. He sang his farmer song and began his farmer dance. On hearing this story, most of the listeners thought, we know this already. I studied biology in sixth grade. Is, what are you talking about, this story? You're wasting our time. And they got up and went off. I, I wasted all that time going to hear this guy speak and this is what happened. They had ears, but they didn't hear. But there were others, including the 12. They were different. They realized Jesus is talking about something important. I need to know this. And they wanted to ask questions and learn. They had humble hearts, truth-seeking desire. They wanted to know the meaning. And when Jesus was alone, they came and asked him about the parables. I think Jesus was very glad. <laughs> Some people came and asked him about the parables. And he explained to them why he taught in parables. He said, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. 
But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Ever hearing, never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Jesus' quote from Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 is paradoxical. Why is there an exclamation point there? At first glance, it seems that maybe God doesn't want people to know the message of forgiveness. But we know that's not true. God's intention is the opposite. God really wants people to accept the forgiveness of sins. This was Jesus' main message. In fact, receiving Jesus' forgiveness is the secret of the kingdom of God. Those who receive his forgiveness become children of God. Their lives become so blessed and so happy. But there's also a warning here. This blessing is given only to those who turn from their sins. Those who don't turn from their sins cannot receive, and they remain under the power of darkness and sin. Well, as we've seen throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus is ready to forgive our sins. He stands by, eager to forgive our sins. Let's listen to Jesus' words. Receive his forgiveness and become children of God who enjoy his kingdom. Amen. Second, unfruitful and fruitful soil. Though Jesus was pleased with those who came to him, he mildly admonished them. Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? Then he explained the meaning of the parable. The sowers are Jesus and his disciples, those who preach God's word. The seed is God's word, and the soils refer to people's hearts. And though Jesus describes four kinds of soil, there are just two kinds of people, unfruitful people and fruitful people. Unfruitful hearts are compared to a path, rocky soil and thorny soil. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. Their hearts are so proud the word of God cannot even begin to penetrate into their heart. Though they hear the word, they never accept it. And the consequence is serious. As soon as they don't listen to the word, Satan comes. Satan comes and takes it away from them. They have no word of truth, only the devil's deception and wickedness remains. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. These people are shallow and they're governed by their emotions. But the problem is, they don't commit to Jesus. 
the moment trouble or persecution comes, they quickly fall away. You know, persecution serves a good purpose for a believer. It purifies our hearts from all kinds of false hopes. It strengthens our faith. It helps us take root in Jesus and really grow. So Apostle Paul encourages, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him. We have to take root in Jesus. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. These people's problem is that thorns grow rapidly and eventually choke the word of God out. One thorn is the worries of this life. Worries are endless. Some people are so used to worrying that if they stop worrying, they think something's wrong with them. In truth, worry comes from lack of faith. Another thorn, the deceitfulness of wealth. This arises if we begin to love money and we think money can buy happiness. Money can buy righteousness. Money can buy love. But it doesn't. It's a deception. And people generally fall into greed and become idolaters when they love money. And it's so easy to indulge in all kinds of pleasure seeking for those who have money. So Paul warned, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. One more thorn, the desire for other things, includes sexual immorality, substance abuse, and the like. And these kinds of desires give birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. The common factor of these three kinds of people is that they are all unfruitful, though their situations and conditions are different. Their unfruitfulness cannot be blamed on the seed. There's nothing wrong with the seed. And it cannot be blamed on the sower. It is precisely their fault. Their attitude toward the word of God is not right, and that's the problem. Nothing else. That's why they remain unfruitful. So in order to bear fruit, what should we do? Our hearts must be cultivated. Simply speaking, we need to repent. Repent. That's not a bad word. It is a wonderful word in the Bible. It tells us the way to enter the kingdom of God. When we repent, we receive Jesus' grace and we begin to bear fruit. Any kind of person 
no matter what problem, what history, what issues there may be, when we repent and accept Jesus' grace, we begin to bear fruit. That's the entire solution. And we should know fruit bearing is not optional for human beings. It is God's will for us. God's first words to mankind were the blessing, be fruitful and increase in number. So we should not make any excuse for not being fruitful. Even if we think we have many good reasons, we should not make excuses. We must be fruitful. So how? How can we be? Let's learn from the seed sown on good soil. Let's read verse 20 together. Uh, lightly, uh, not too loud, please. Others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Wow, this soil is amazing. It is so fruitful. And the farmer is so satisfied with his harvest. So what is the secret? to bearing so much fruit like this. It seems like it should be something we have to pay a lot of money to receive. Pay $20,000 and find the secret to fruitfulness. But the Bible tells us so clearly, so plainly, it is to hear the word and accept it. Hear the word and accept it. To hear means that we pay attention to until we fully understand what the word is saying. And to accept means we regard it as the truth which came from God. It is the absolute truth that came from God. So any contrary idea, any other thought, is to be rejected. And the word of God alone stand in our hearts. This is actually simple. It's not complicated. Anyone can do this. Some people want to be extraordinary and they, they think they should do something special and something amazing and great, but it's not necessary. All we have to do is hear the word of God and accept it in our hearts. But that requires humility. We have to honor God more than our own thoughts and ideas. But for those who do, they experience the power of the Word of God. Their lives change, and they become wonderful new people. For example, Jesus told Peter, the fisherman Peter, <laughs> to put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Peter knew it was ridiculous fishing advice. Jesus doesn't know about fishing. I know about fishing. And he's telling me to do something totally which I should not do as a fisherman. But Peter respected Jesus' word. And he said to him, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. He let down the nets, 
he caught such a large number of fish that his nets began to break. Wow! Amazing experience. And this became the foundation for his calling to discipleship and his growth as Jesus' apostle. And this Peter became the foundation of Jesus' church. The most fruitful man in history, in some sense. So, wow, we now know the secret. Hear the word and accept it. But it's not just a one-time thing that we do. We have to continue to hear the word and accept it. It's like being in a vine and branch relationship. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. And his words and his life flow into us and we accept them and let them guide us, nurture us, lead us. And as we remain in Jesus like this, we bear fruit more and more. Instead of getting angry, we become loving. Instead of being hateful, we become so peaceful and gracious. We bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We become wonderful new people and can fulfill God's purpose for our lives. We find amazing meaning, <laughs> overflowing blessing. It's a wonderful life. As I thought about the deep meaning of Jesus' parable, two examples came to mind one negative and one positive. Recently, a noted Christian apologist, Ravi Zacharias, passed away. And shortly afterward, Christianity Today revealed that he had abused many women around the world over a period of years. And the allegations are numerous and specific and his behavior was likely criminal. This was so discouraging to hear. Many women's lives were ruined by him. How, how could this have happened? Though many people were evangelized through him, we cannot say he was fruitful. Instead, God's name is blasphemed among unbelievers because of him. He's so highly gifted, such an excellent communicator, but his character was not transformed by the word of God. He was so successful, but his life was miserable. He was a slave of lustful desire. This should be a warning to us all. We are all vulnerable to the power of sin. I'm vulnerable, and we need Jesus' help and Jesus' grace every day. When we study the Word of God, we need to listen to the Word of God. Accept it in our hearts and let it change us from the inside out. We need to examine ourselves when we study the Bible. When we really honor God's Word, and take it to heart, it will transform us. We will change in Jesus. And this kind of change, transformation, is more important than trying to do some kind of great work. 
On the other hand, there is an unknown evangelist named George Lyle. He was an African American born into slavery in Virginia in 1750. His father was known as the only genuine Christian among the slaves in his vicinity. And George had the fear of God, and he tried to do good works with his life. But as he was listening to Pastor Matthew Moore uh, deliver a message about sin, he was convicted that he was a sinner and that he needed salvation. And he despaired for six months, not knowing what to do. And later he heard another message by Pastor Moore, inviting him to come to Jesus. Jesus forgives. Jesus changes. And he accepted Jesus. His life changed. He found true freedom in Jesus Christ. He lived out the gospel truth as a good, faithful husband and a good father to his sons. He supported his family by transporting cargo with a horse and wagon. He worked hard. He was also recognized as a messenger of God's word. And he was raised as the first black preacher in the Baptist church in the USA. Because of his faithfulness and powerful preaching, many were converted to Christ through him. He emphasized that anyone, slave or free, can have true freedom in Jesus Christ. And through him, churches were planted in South Carolina, in Georgia, later in Jamaica. Space does not allow to tell of all his good works. I hope you take time to research him. It's worthwhile. But suffice to say that his influence spread to Nova Scotia, England, Sierra Leone. In fact, he was the first missionary sent out from the USA years before Adoniram Judson. But he's not recognized because he was African American, because he was a slave, and because he supported the British during the Revolutionary War. So you don't hear about him. But Jesus knows him. Jesus knows him. He's a great man in the sight of God. What a wonderful, fruitful life, beautiful life, this humble man of God lived. His biographer calls him an unsung hero. So what is better? Great fame and wealth and power with an unchanged sinful nature or true transformation of the heart by the gospel of Christ and living a most fruitful life in him. In today's passage, Jesus teaches us to have a right attitude toward the word of God. The word of God has power. If we humbly accept the word planted in us, it will save us. It will transform us. And this is the way of real happiness and fruitful ministry. But if we're too proud to deeply accept it and really honor God who has given this word, will not be fruitful. So let's pray that we may accept the word of God in our hearts and be fruitful in Jesus Christ. Let me pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, you have given us such a clear message how we can be fruitful by hearing the word of God and accepting it in our hearts. Help each one of us to do so and make each of us very fruitful for your glory and the blessing of your people. I ask in Jesus' name.